The Untold Stories of Sanibel Island After the Ferry is made possible in part by the Lee County Government County Commission, City of Sanibel City Council, City of Sanibel Historic Preservation Committee, Bailey's General Store, Sanibel Captiva Community Bank, Sanibel Captiva Kiwanis Club, and the Sanibel Captiva Chamber of Commerce. Memories, recollections, facts, and figures make up the life stories we pass down from generation to generation. These oral and written histories about the people and places of our past shape how we live today. Together, let's relive some of the untold stories about Sanibel Island in the last half of the 20th century. It's special people and places and the characteristics that make this sanctuary island a unique place to live and work. We'll hear about controversies surrounding the building of a causeway, the birth of Sanibel as a city, the people that helped preserve its nature and history, and the many organizations and groups that make Sanibel so magical. Life on Sanibel in the 1950s was a bit primitive. Roads were rough and rugged, Homes weren't air-conditioned. The island even set a world record for the number of mosquitoes captured in one evening. The ferry was the only way to come back and forth to the island, and they were small ferries. There were four of them at the end of uh, the run. And uh, of course, it only ran during the daytime. I remember the first time I came over on that ferry, it was, it was magical. And we, we just went, the pace was so slow. And it was an invitation to this beautiful island that looked totally deserted. The ferry was, was the joy of every island kid. Uh, if you got to go to Fort Myers, that in itself was a special day. And um, riding on the ferry was fun because you could watch the dolphin and you know just have a free time running around the boat. For some, the ferry wasn't sufficient. They wanted to connect Sanibel and the mainland for automobile access. Hugo Lindgren, um, who owned a considerable acreage on the east end of the island, um, wanted to sell lots. And um, he felt that there was no way to get enough people over here to buy his properties without an actual road access. Certainly controversial. Most of us didn't want it. Even though we were in business, we didn't want it. We were pleased with the way we were living. I opposed it. I was with the group that opposed it. We fought it to the Supreme Court. We lost. It's there. In 1963, the Sanibel Causeway was completed at a cost of just under $3 million. For the first time, Sanibel residents and visitors had a land route on and off the beloved island. Once they did complete the span closest to the island, uh, we would ride our bikes out and we would go to the first Causeway Island. And they were absolutely littered with fossils. It was amazing to see these crystal shells. As soon as the Causeway opened, everything, you know, increased dramatically uh, each year. There were probably 300, 400 people on the island when the Causeway was built. By 1970, there were close to a thousand, and then it just increased tremendously. Before and after the causeway, the preservation of the island's native plants, beaches, and wildlife has been at the heart of Sanibel's culture. Symbolic was J.N. Ding Darling, a Pulitzer Prize winning political cartoonist who arrived on Sanibel in the 1930s. His love and appreciation of the wildlife of Sanibel prompted him to push for the establishment of a national wildlife refuge. In 1945, President Harry Truman established the Sanibel National Wildlife Refuge. When Ding Darling died in early 1962, people felt that the refuge, which was called the Sanibel National Refuge, should be named in his honor since it was largely due to his efforts that it became a refuge at all. So they began what was a five-year fight to um, actually have the refuge uh, turned into federal hands 
and also named after Ding Darling. They wanted it as a memorial to Ding Darling, but um, the real big effort was also to, to keep it protected. Preserving the natural state of the island and managing growth has remained a common theme for Sanibel. The period immediately following the renaming of the National Preserve and the building of the causeway represented a time of particularly acute change. The county commissions in the 60s and 70s were basically all pro-development. Uh, they looked at their tax base and they wanted the tax base to grow. The 70s started activity, business activity, more people opened businesses, and uh, more people came to build uh, winter homes. When the developers were coming in to build condominium and high rises, and I think some of the land that they now have on reserve could have been built on, but I think they heard a voice and noticed that there was something there that maybe this person didn't avow, avow that he was going to do, and they stopped it. The county was issuing permits right and left out here, and, and it was um, really becoming overwhelming. And uh, people could just see the entire island being smothered uh, if something wasn't done. They started to investigate home rule, the possibilities there. In the early 70s, appalled by Lee County's proposals for massive development on their sanctuary island, a majority of Sanibel citizens decided the best way to combat development was to become a city. In the early 1970s, the Island Reporter was put together by um, uh, Don Whitehead, Fred Walton, and Porter Goss. And um, that was really, I think, the opening gun in terms of incorporation because the paper was um, right here on the island, written by Islanders. I worked at the Island Reporter um, back in the, in the 70s. And actually, Porter Goss was somewhat of a, a silent partner there. Um, there were, I believe, five partners that started the Island Reporter. And uh, it, was, it was small, but it was the enlightened paper. There was another big fight. <laughs> Sanibel doesn't ever have little arguments. It's a big controversy. Everybody gets heated up. People said all of the Indians left here. I think maybe the Indians did, but the chiefs are still here. <laughs> Incorporation brought all that out, another big um, brouhaha. But we really needed to incorporate because we had no, no influence on our destiny. Went on for a year or more um, and uh, was debated at meetings. It went to the state um, legislature and um, they just squeaked through. We incorporated, um, the vote was in November in 1974. They had some controversy on it, but uh, basically the people that uh, like Porter and my brother Francis and Charles, and uh, 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 you know, uh, got together and, and uh, made a city out of us. After Sanibel was officially incorporated, a group of forward-thinking people was elected as Sanibel's first city council. They pulled their resources and got to work on establishing a comprehensive land use plan. There was another election in December. 18 people ran and um, they took the top five vote getters. Um, Porter Goss was the top vote getter, so therefore he became mayor. He uh, got something like 70% of the vote. And the other uh, councilmen were Francis Bailey, uh, Charles LaBeouf, Zelda or Z. Butler, and Vernon McKenzie. One of the goals of the city charter was the establishment of a comprehensive land use plan. And we, we did that, we, we finalized that in 1976, and that was uh, just a, a battle. In 1974, the city of Sanibel Incorporated. 
and before they established any land use plan, they decided that they would implement a moratorium on development and begin a study of the natural systems here on Sanibel. That study, which is the Sanibel plan, became the comprehensive land use plan for the city. Through efforts of establishing the refuge and then following that the Conservation Foundation's land acquisition program and following that the City of Sanibel's land acquisition program. Um, the community's been able to preserve around two-thirds of Sanibel through this partnership. Just as Sanibel attracted the civic-minded and the environmentally committed, it also attracted artists and their supporters. Sanibel has always attracted artistic people. We've had novelists, we've had a lot of writers, a lot of artists. It seems to inspire creativity. The arts in the community were quite slim for a while. They had black and white movies at the Island Inn every Sunday, which was fun because there wasn't a lot to do. However, as more people came to the Island, they wanted a little bit more than black and white movies. The old schoolhouse was vacated for some time, and the hunters came along from New York. Uh, her big claim to fame was she'd been in Tobacco Road for quite a while, but I know they were on radio too, and they were theatrical people. So they started a little theater, and um, it was a different kind of entertainment for us. It did well. In the, the mid-70s, the city was just a brand new city then, and they decided that artists and writers needed to have a license. We felt that, you know, this community should support the arts. So we got together, I think there were maybe 20 of us, and we went to the community center across the street in the parking lot, and um, we dug a trench, a heart-shaped trench, and that was our protest to the tax. There are many, many more artists now than, than and there's some wonderful artists here. We have some world-class artists. You have a lot of Sunday painters, too. Since being established in 1979, the Barrier Island Group for the Arts, or Big Arts, has grown to become the heart of artistic endeavors on the island. Big Arts, in the beginning, was, it was a place for the artists to get together and actually have fun. And uh, there was a lot of camaraderie. Um, it was hard work. The island is known for conservation and beautiful sunshine and beautiful beaches and, and we have an awful lot of people who, who know us all around the world. But what people don't expect is that we also have a very a thriving, vital arts community and it's personified my way of thinking with big arts. We have a 400 seat auditorium that's uh, filled frequently. We have lots of sellouts. We have uh, wonderful art exhibits. Uh, people really come together to celebrate life here. Sanibel is known for and recognized for its flora and fauna. But another natural claim to fame has been synonymous with Sanibel for decades. In the early days, people would come to Sanibel attracted by the large number of shells that can be found here. As a result of that, a very active shelling community developed on the island. Um, the Shell Club was established uh, along with shell shows. Because of all these efforts, um, a one-of-its-kind museum, the Bailey Matthews Shell Museum, was established here on the island. Bailey Matthews Shell Museum is a non-profit uh, organization that has education as the main focus of its mission. What we try to do is to use um, mollusks as models to explain um, basic facts in, in biology, conservation science, ecology, and also to show the different ways shells have been used by humans throughout history. Preservation of the island's past has always been vital to the citizens of Sanibel. This passion has been embodied in the Sanibel Historical Village and Museum. Sanibel uh, stayed 
undeveloped really, except for a few families for so long until after the Second World War. And then as it started to change and people got uh, aware that uh, a lot of people were looking towards Sanibel to not only live here, but to run establishments here. When I first arrived here to, to live, uh, it almost, I immediately became interested and involved in the preservation part of the island. And they were beginning to, to uh, put the ideas together and uh, formulate a plan development code called historic preservation. And I fortunately got an opportunity to be involved in that. I started working on the idea of having a village here. And I got the idea from, from an old cracker. And once I moved this store here, then people just lined up and wanting to help. And it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, the people have gotten behind the, the effort and, and made this village possible. When people visit our village and they go through with docents who, who tell the history, that's what we're all about, and they leave with an entirely different feeling about what Sanibel was like many, many years ago, and they realize how simple life was. When you get up in your 80s, boy, <laughs> you're part of history. <laughs> and uh, I, I just was delighted with the the help and the interest and support that, uh, that I got in, in uh, developing this village. This kind of community spirit and support has been demonstrated through Sanibel's Community Association that has catered to the social, civic, and philanthropic needs of the island's people. All of our entertainment centered around the Community Association building. Square dances, cakewalks, um, even showers when somebody was going to have a baby, it would be there and everybody would be invited. Our Christmases were there. We were content. In 1925, a community fair that was held on the porch of the, island, the old Island Inn, and it was so successful that they did it again the next year uh, on the porch of Cassie Bell Hotel. The following year it had grown so much that a gentleman by the name of Curtis Perry got the idea to form the Community Association. And he actually went from one end of the island on foot to raise money. Well, the community house was built by a group of uh, people that were public spirited, of which my father was a prominent one. Just about every organization um, has had its beginning here. The Shell Fair originally started in 1927 when this building was built. The first ribbons and trophies we have records of are in the mid-50s. Since then, it has grown to be a full-scale Shell Show and Fair. The library actually started in a closet over at the uh, community house, and it grew and it grew and it moved to a new place and another place until um, today we're in quite a beautiful building just down the street. Today at the community house, um, we still have our organizations that meet here and call us home. The conservationist beliefs and ideals of Jay Ending Darling live on and are being realized through the people of today's Sanibel. Uh, today with uh, land acquisition of private tracts and uh, exchanges with the state of Florida for, for some of the state lands, it's up in the vicinity of 6,000 acres. That, that includes both upland, mangroves, and bay bottom. A person coming to the refuges today is going to find a myriad of things to do, things to see, and to be a part of. Uh, anything from being one of the premier birding refuges in the country, uh, to the ability to get out into a mangrove estuary system and actually be within and be a part of the system itself, watching wildlife uh, essentially live its day and do its thing. Uh, we also have outreach with uh, school kids. We actually, uh, through our Ding Darling Wildlife Society, provide opportunities uh, through buses and education programs to be, bring children from off-island onto the island to get a better understanding. 
Well, the new visitor center is fantastic. It's well done. The exhibits are excellent. The staff is outstanding. And even if you're a novice and when it comes to uh, getting a feel for conservation or hands-on knowledge of what's going on to save natural resources and wildlife species, you'll get a, a good education there at that starting, starting point. The natural habitats of Sanibel have served as a laboratory for many environmental scientists. And yet Sanibel also has had to learn a few lessons the hard way. Uh, I wrote an ordinance back in uh, 74, 75 that prohibited the feeding of alligators on Sanibel. We passed that unanimously. Florida recognized this may be an important tool in, in regulating or, or trying to prevent interaction between humans and alligators. So alligators can no longer be fed, artificially fed in the, in the state of Florida. And that all started right here on, on Sanibel Island. On refuge lands, uh, we control those very carefully. Uh, but we tend to want to, we control the people more than we control the gators because of the mission of the service. Uh, we regulate where people go and what they do. Uh, there are a number of alligator attacks in the past uh, three years, uh, including two fatalities, one of them, Janie Melsick. And uh, at that point, uh, people just recognized that the rules needed to be tightened and changed. And then with the death of Janie Melsick, it just uh, took the wind out of me. Uh, I don't think I'll ever recover uh, because, of, because of that death. And now more recently, a death over at Health Park in a pond. Uh, just, just pure tragedy. People must not feed alligators. The citizens of Sanibel have overcome many challenges in the past half century. However, new challenges are ever present. The city council of today is is probably faced with some of the same challenges we had to face. Uh, in time, they'll have to, uh, to re-examine traffic circulation, especially with, with the new bridge. They'll need to take some real modern approaches to uh, traffic outflow. Well, we have changed on Santa Fe over the years, and um, more and more people have seen it as a place to come and make money perhaps rather than to retire or to raise a family. And I think the years ahead we're going to have to face the question of how residential we can keep it as opposed to commercial. I think the challenge is for, for any arts organization is just to, um, is to stay open, uh, to, to um, offer many different things for many different people, for many different ages. Uh, it's very important to stay vital. We need, we need new people, new ideas. Historically, people came here because of the wonderful weather, the beautiful beaches, the shells, and, and the uh, idea of preservation. And of course, the city, when it incorporated, kept those ideas. And, and it's so beautifully stated in the Sanibel Plan, if you, if you read it, that this is exactly what our goals are always. It's to keep it as much a, a, a beautiful island as we possibly can. Sanibel Island boasts a rich history, a one-of-a-kind tapestry woven with threads of pristine beauty and rugged, untouched wilds. It's this combination that creates the magic that is Sanibel Island. I think the island uh, Sanibel Island produces its own magic. <laughs> the magic from, for Sanibel Island comes from a lot of sources, but it comes most importantly and primarily from the, uh, the aspect of nature and wildlife. I don't know where the magic comes from, but you certainly feel it if you live here. It's beautiful, that's one thing. It attracts wonderful people, too. I honestly believe that the magic of Sanibel is very personal, and I think everyone has a, a different idea of why it's so special to them. I don't know that there are too many places in 
America anyway, where you can find this, this gentleness, this beautiful, tranquil feeling that you get when you're on this island. It's still probably the, one of the nicest places in the world to live. It's been my home forever. And it just, well, it's home, that's it. And the people here are great people. And it just, it's part of, it's part of me. A whole heck of a lot of me. To order a video of this program, call 1-888-824-0030 or visit our website at wgcu.org. And please refer to the program number on your screen.